Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Um, I hope nobody who's here was here at Brad's reading because if if I tried to do that for like two seconds. Um, I, I really appreciate all you guys coming. There, there are a lot of people here who have been supportive of me during the whole process of writing the book. Uh, people who edited, people who traveled out to Montana to read pages on our couch out there, um, you know, people who, who helped with my reporting. So I really appreciate you guys being here um, and showing your support here again tonight. So um, the idea of this book actually was, it was sort of born out of frustration. Um, and, and the idea crystallized for me the, the first and only time that I flew on Air Force One. I'd, I'd taken this job uh, for the Washington Post where I'd been working for a while, where it was my assignment to write sort of more personal, intimate stories about the presidency and, and what the president's life is like. Um, and it only took me like maybe a week of doing that job to realize that the president doesn't really have personal, intimate moments, certainly none that I was going to get access to. I mean, Everything about his life is outsourced in this you know, really crazy way. I mean, he has 94 butlers and maids serve the family in the White House, six calligraphers write anything he wants written, 78 people make his schedule every day. I mean, it, it's this huge army that sort of helps him operate in, it, in this day-to-day -day way, and his schedule is subdivided into these 15-minute chunks, and there's, there's a secretary who sits outside the Oval Office, which actually has a reverse peephole, so she can look in through the door at him and make sure that things are running on schedule. Um, you know, he, he, calls that, he calls it the bubble, and uh, I think sometimes it really drives him crazy. And in the, the few weeks that I'd been doing this job, it had been driving me crazy, probably also my editors crazy, because I was probably not writing as many stories as they were hoping I was going to write, um, and not getting to those sort of really personal moments in, in Obama's life. So, you know, finally, after doing this for, for you know, it would probably been a few months at this point, my, my turn came up to fly on Air Force One. And, and the way flying on Air Force One works is pretty much everybody who covers the president, like your name is put into this huge database. Um, and, and every time the president goes on a trip, you know, it's, they move through this database and eight more people get their turn to fly on Air Force One. Um, so my name came up and I, I finally thought, all right, this is the moment where I'm going to see something, I'm going to be up close and like, I'll have a chance to sort of experience what this is like a little bit for him. Um, so, you know, got dressed up, Obama flies out of, out of a private Air Force base in Virginia. Um, you know, got dressed up. I uh, actually rented a car to drive over there because Rachel and I's car at the time was like a battered Pontiac Grand Am that we'd managed to keep functional by like jerry-rigging the hood down with parachute rope. Uh, it didn't really feel appropriate to pull onto the tarmac next to Air Force One. <laughs> so rented a car. I'm sure they gave me like a Volkswagen bug, but uh, still rented a car, drove over there, waited with like these eight other reporters um, as we waited sort of for our turn to board the plane. Um, we waited for maybe, you know, I don't know, an hour, and then they led us up. There are two, two entr entrances on Air Force One. They led us up this back one that's kind of back by the, you know, the, the far rear of the airplane. We walked up the stairs, we sat down, and they said, okay, wait here, we're waiting for the president to arrive at the airport. So we waited for maybe a half an hour. Uh, then we heard, okay, the president is arriving at the airport. And, like you have never seen reporters move this fast. There was a mad scramble to get back off the plane to watch the president's motorcade arrive, and then we saw him walk six steps up the separate entrance of the plane to the front of the plane. Um, so, you know, those six steps were very illuminating. We saw, like, what he was wearing and, and what he was doing, uh, and we all were frantically taking notes about it. Um, we got back on the plane. We flew to New Hampshire. We scrambled off the plane as fast as we could to watch the president walk those six steps again back into his motorcade. We followed behind separately in a different car to the event. Um, this event, actually, there was not enough time or space for the press to go into the event with him. So we were off-site in a satellite location where we watched the speech on like closed-circuit TV. And uh, you know, we're, we're taking notes off the event that way. So I was sitting there feeling, you know, honestly, just um, really frustrated with, with trying to, to write about the presidency in any kind of meaningful way. Um, and I was listening to his speech, and I heard him say something that I'd heard him talk about before, but you know, it, it just sort of clicked. He, he talked about these 10 letters that he reads every night, which 
are a sampling of the 20,000 letters that come into the White House every day. And you know, he talked about how these letters were what he felt like were his only direct connection left to people out in the country and the people that he governed. And he said that the letters were the thing that sometimes kept him sane when he felt like he was so barricaded from so many other things. Um, and you know, I, I realized pretty quickly then that that was something that seemed personal and real and genuine, and that was something that I wanted to try to write about. Um, so that's what I did. It, it started with a story for the Post. Um, I wrote a, a longer piece about the process of getting these 10 letters to his desk. Um, then the paper was generous enough to, to give me a, a leave for a year where I, I did go out to Montana. And, and I think they've totally eliminated the distinguished from that profession, professor title now. But uh, so went out there and wrote. Um, and at the end of this year, finally did get uh, time on the president's schedule where that secretary was looking in through that reverse peephole at, at us while we talked about the letters. Um, and I'll read, I'll read a, a brief part of the book now that's sort of, you know, uh, from, from that half hour I had with him about what this mail means to him. The president said the hardest letters for him to read were the ones that made him feel remote, even powerless. People tended to write to their president when circumstances turned dire. Sealing a prayer into an envelope is a matter of last resort. What resulted each day inside Obama's purple folder was an intimate view of hardship and personal struggle, a wave of desperation capable of overwhelming the senses. So many writers needed urgent help, Obama said, and yet the act of governing was so slow that it sometimes took years before legislation could actually improve people's lives. A few times during his presidency, Obama had been so moved by a letter that he had written a personal check or made a phone call on the writer's behalf, believing it was the only way to ensure a fast result. It's not something I should advertise, but it has happened, he said. Many other times, he had forwarded letters to government agencies or cabinet secretaries after attaching a standard, handwritten note that read, can you please take care of this? These letters can be heartbreaking, just heartbreaking, he said. Some you read and you say, gosh, I really want to help this person, and I may not have the tools to help them right now. And then you start thinking about the fact that for every one person who wrote describing their story, there might be another 100,000 going through the same thing. So there are times when I'm reading the letters and I feel pain that I can't do more faster to make a difference in their lives. He said his nightly reading in the White House sometimes made him pine for his days as a community organizer back in the 1980s when he was making $10,000 a year and working on the south side of Chicago. He had just graduated from college and he purchased a used car for $2,000 and spent his days driving around the city's housing projects to speak with residents about their lives. He became familiar with many of the same issues that would flood his mail 25 years later. Housing calamities, chronic unemployment, and struggling schools. Obama's fellow organizers in Chicago considered him a master of hands-on, granular problem solving. He was skinny and boyish, a good listener if still a bit naive and some of the older women in the housing projects made a habit of inviting him into their homes and cooking for him. He looked around their apartments, keeping a log of maintenance issues and then delivering that list to the landlord. He helped arrange meetings with city housing officials to talk about his bestest problems. He established a tenants' rights organization, founded a job training program, and led a tutoring group that prepared students for college. When he left for Harvard Law School after three years in Chicago, Obama had set his path for his future. He wanted to become a politician, a job that would allow him to listen to people's problems and enjoy the simple satisfaction of solving them. Now, he was the most powerful politician of all, and yet fixing problems seemed more difficult and satisfaction more elusive. The people were right there in front of me, and I could say, let's go to the alderman's office, or let me be an advocate in some fashion, Obama said. And here, just because of the nature of the office and the scope of the issues, you're removed in ways that are frustrating. Sometimes what you want to do is pick up the phone and say, tell me more about what's going on, and let me see if I can be your social worker, be your advocate, be your mortgage advisor, be your employment counselor. So what I have to constantly reconcile in my mind is that I have a very specific role to play in this office, and I've got to make a bunch of big decisions that you hope in the aggregate will end up having a positive effect over this many lives, but you can't always be certain. That was one of the reasons Obama had taken to responding by hand to a few letters each night. He still liked the satisfaction of providing at least one thing, immediate and concrete. So what I, what I would do when I picked a letter that I was going to write about um, 
and really the part of the book that I enjoy the most is I, I would then go and spend you know, a week, uh, more than that sometimes, with these people who'd written to the president and received back responses from him 